The Kalam cosmological argument has a fairly extensive history in the annals of theology, but it was mostly forgotten until William Lane Craig, a doctor of philosophy, published a reworked version of the argument in 1979, and Dr. Craig has been actively defending this argument ever since. The argument, as Dr. Craig often states, is deceptively simple, containing only two premises and the conclusion, although he does often go into great detail. But for convenience sake, here's Dr. Craig briefly summarizing his Kalam cosmological argument. Premise one is that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Something cannot come into being uncaused out of absolutely nothing. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two is that the universe began to exist. And from those two premises, it follows logically, therefore, the universe has a cause of its existence. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. It's worth noting that in debates, Dr. Craig often says that premise one is rarely contested. After all, most people agree that something cannot come into existence from nothing and without any cause. Dr. Craig usually then goes on to quote various physicists and philosophers who plainly say that the Big Bang occurred from nothing. And to be fair, physicists do often say this, especially in the context of explaining the Big Bang to an audience that is unfamiliar with the intimate details of physics. Today, we have the Big Bang, the equally remarkable idea that the universe simply began from nothing. There's really nothing. There's no space, there's no time, there's no matter, there's no energy. It's nothing but the potential to exist. And out of that bursts the universe. The problem here is that what most of us might think of as nothing is in fact not what physicists are talking about. As NASA astronomer Dr. Sten Odenwald writes, when physicists say nothing, they are being playful with the English language because we often think of the vacuum as being empty or nothing, when in fact physicists know full well that the vacuum is far from empty. Nothingness was not nothing, but it was not anything like the kinds of somethings we know about today. We have no words to describe it, and the ones we borrow that are listed in the Oxford English Dictionary are based on the wrong physical insight. The point that Dr. Oderwald is making is that even in what we would consider a total vacuum or a complete void, quantum fields still exist. And in the quantum world, it is not uncommon for particles to jump in and out of existence without a cause. These particles are called virtual particles, and luckily Dr. Craig has already addressed this point. Virtual particles do not come into being uncaused out of nothing. Virtual particles appear in the quantum vacuum which is a sea of fluctuating energy. It is a rich physical reality endowed with a structure and governed by physical laws. So that when popular magazines and articles uh, portray uh, things coming into being in the vacuum as uncaused out of nothing, they're using the word nothing in a philosophically naive and misleading sense. But what Dr. Craig fails to realize is that the nothingness from which virtual particles appear is the same nothingness from which the Big Bang singularity appeared, albeit under different circumstances. So Dr. Craig has two options here. Either he can accept that certain things can come into existence without a cause, which would negate his first premise, or he could say that the nature of the quantum field is a plausible first cause of the Big Bang which would undermine his desired conclusion that God was the first cause. Although many proponents of the Kalam cosmological argument might hold up its simplicity as a virtue, in fact, it's this reliance on common sense that is its greatest weakness. Anybody who has studied physics will tell you that our common sense is notoriously erroneous. And this especially holds true in the field of quantum mechanics, which is an important part in understanding the origin of the universe. To understand these sorts of things, we must use observable evidence and reliable mathematics. Dr. Craig offers neither.